so that we can record and send the session out. Um, okay. And then I'm going to go and I'm going to share our screen so we can have a discussion. Now, we may be calling on you guys um, to share stuff. And so we're all kind of learning the Zoom etiquette here. So um, try not to forget to unmute yourself when, we, when you share. So, um, and then re-mute yourself when uh, you're done speaking just to cut down on background noise. So I'm going to get to my screen here and I'm going to share it. Can you all see my asking better questions screen? Give me, you can do a thumbs up. Give me a up. thumbs up if you can see my screen asking better questions. Okay. All right. So, Based on your survey results, Steph and I put this together um, to get started for our first Zoom session. So, um, and bear with us here because this is the first big Zoom session we've done ourselves. Mm -hmm. So if we, we'd love your feedback on that too, what we need to make better. Um, but this is the first topic that many of you suggested that you would like more information about. And so this is where we're going to start today. And so, of course, it's Stephanie Wanick and myself presenting today. So, um, hope you like our emojis up there at the top. It's so nice to see all of your faces again um, after our trainings this summer. So, I we hope that your school year's off to a great start, and we're just so glad you could join us today. All right. So, a couple housekeeping items to begin with. Um, first of all, in order to kind of centralize all of your communication and details for this entire year of uh, our para training sessions. I've created a website on Google Sites. Steph and I put it together. That's the title is Paras of ESU 8. And hopefully you've had a chance to get on that website. So everything that you should need for um, Anything with this training is going to be on that website, and I'm going to get out of the presentation to, to walk you through just a little bit here. Um, these are our Zoom sessions throughout the year, and if you click right here when you're live here, i got to go to the live site, um, it will take you to the resource page with everything you need, all the way from the Zoom link to the training resources, anything that you might need for the para. Um, training series. And um, one thing on the front page I wanted to point out to you too is our contact email is down at the bottom. So um, please make sure that you visit that site. It has the registration link, it has the Zoom link, it has the resources, anything that you might want. And I'll let Steph talk about the email list here. Sorry about the ringing phone. We are in our small little offices for a couple years and we don't have a conference room to go to for this kind of thing. Um, so the email list, um, when I tried to email all of you before this training based on the emails that we got at our face-to-face -face trainings, um, we, um, um, we uh, had a lot of the emails bounce back to us. Sorry, Tina's going to go help somebody get connected to this meeting. Um, so um, basically, if you did not get some emails from us on um, the email that you gave us at those, at those beginning of your meetings, um, please email us your address again. Um, so we want to have you um, part of this and getting um, communications and really emails are only option at this point. You can always check in on the website and that's great, but we would like um, for you to also be receiving our emails. Okay, so we'll continue on here. As we ask better questions, we really think about the art and science of asking questions is the source of all knowledge. So um, we really need to get at what kids know by asking really good questions. Okay, so why? And um, by the way, the all of this PowerPoint, um, 
we'll follow along um, on your copies that hopefully your principal made. Um, so um, those were given out and they're also in our resources on our website. So if you don't have them today, you can go back and refer to them later. Okay, so why? Um, what are you trying to get your students to learn here? Well, if you ask good questions, you engage, um, you really can engage the mind. And we just want to, we, you know, we want to get to this why here. What are the goals of our questioning? So what do we um, expect kids to know and learn from questioning? Um, actually, teachers spend about 30 to 50% of instructional time um, asking questions. And um, so let's have you guys discuss um, in your groups, um, you know, why, you know, what the goal is of asking questions. What's the purpose for asking questions? And I'm gonna come back here to our room so I can see everybody and we can discuss this a little bit. Okay, so I might start picking on people. Who has something to say about why do we ask questions? Otherwise, I'm gonna call on you. <laughs> Any ideas? Okay, we said engaged over here. Okay, we wanna keep kids engaged. Thank you, Angie. Yes. Um, um, definitely, just like right now, when I asked you a question, I want to make sure that you're engaged. I want to make sure that you're on the topic of the class. So I asked a question, okay? Yeah. Anyone um, else? Are we on? Can you hear us? Yes. Okay. See if they're retaining information. Absolutely. See if they're retaining information. See, we, we're going to check for learning there, right? We want to check for learning and make sure that they um, are learning the things we're talking about. Okay, so good. Thanks for participating. Um, and um, we'll continue to call on you um, here and there throughout this class um, today. Um, and we'll talk about a few more. A few more reasons and goals of questioning. Okay, so I'm going back. I lost my guru here because, um, you know, she, uh, Tina is my guru of Zoom. Okay. Well, let me see here. <laughs> Sorry, guys, you're bearing with us. We can still see you. Okay, good. I'm going to go through. Do you guys all have the handouts with you? I'm, I've lost Tina's. Um, maybe it's there. This is the hazard when you're on somebody else's computer. <laughs> I've lost our presentation on your computer oh. here, my dear. Hey, welcome to Growing <laughs> Pains with Technology. All right. Um, oh. We had some people that were uh, oh, right. Right. Yeah, it's computer. that couldn't get on. <laughs> but we're there now. Okay, so we should be able to. All right. How's everybody doing out there? 
Well, there she is. Hold on. <laughs> Sounds like we have no conversation. All right. Here Anybody who you, joined us you know, now, you'll want to you mute your microphone for now. At the bottom of the screen, you can click on mute so that we don't get a lot of electronic feedback. We want your voice feedback um, occasionally, though. <laughs> yes, yes. And we'll ask for that when it's time. Okay. So we are back in our presentation here. And basically some questions are better than other questions to ask. And we need to think about um, really honing in on that skill of asking those really good questions. And, and we talked about that each, each type of question usually has a purpose. So it's not like there's not a place for some of those yes or no questions, but you want to think deeper than a yes or no question. So here are some reasons why we ask questions. So some of you said this, um, I think Jefferson Elementary, you guys said that you want to actively involve the students in, less, in the lesson. You want to get that high engagement in the lesson. So that's one purpose of asking questions. You want to increase their motiva motivation or interest. And so if you can ask a question in a way that's really going to engage them or get them curious about something, that's a great way to start. You also might want to evaluate their preparation or their background knowledge on a topic. Like, hey, what do you already know about this thing that we're going to learn today? And you might also want to check on the completion of their work. So it might be a question that just relates to what they've been working on. If you've given them work time, then you might want to ask a, a question that would relate to um, that topic of information, but even dig a little deeper. And Boyd County, that was, I think, Boyd County or was it Stewart? Somebody out there mentioned that in our um in our discussion Ooh, way to go guys Woohoo! also we really want to have them um develop some critical thinking skills so anymore in society it isn't just about a yes no um, question it just isn't about a right answer but how can they critically think through a problem solving process and we want kids to think like that um and um you know be creative and um and find solutions to problems and another way, you want to click one more time. There we go. Is to review. Oops, sorry, we both clicked. Um, review previous lessons, and so you might engage them in a conversation about a lesson that they had done previously that might relate to what they're going to do now, and that also kind of helps with engagement and collaboration because they are pulling then from prior knowledge and making the connections between even cross curriculum items. Uh, we also want to nurture their insights, and we, we know that kids feel good when they get called on, when they get to answer a question for the class. Uh, we want to make them feel good about the things that they're adding. Another reason why questions are so important is because you can assess them quickly through a question. Um, you can at, at see at what level that they're understanding the objectives that the teacher has for them, and you can kind of gauge where you need to start um, supporting them. We're going to stimulate some independent learning here too. So if we can ask some questions and then set kids out on their own to answer those questions or find answers, um, that's, that's really the goal of independent learning. So, no, nope, that's okay. So why, why do we need to ask good questions? And, and that seems like a, a silly phrase, but in reality, why, why do we want to develop this good questioning processes? And first of all, is to, to show more meaning, to get more involved with the information and have the students really develop their own logical thinking. We also want to foster that curiosity that they're going to go off and learn on their own. Now, I think that elementary students really um, can be um, guided towards this. If you bring something up in class and they're the kids who are going to run home and keep doing some research at night because they're really interested in it, uh, maybe our trick is when we're working with older students, how do we really get their curiosity going? And I think it's really um, playing into their interests in class and things like that and um, getting them to go beyond. 
And sometimes that also has to do with like a gotcha, you know, um, not really a gotcha, but a, a wow factor. If you can kind of bring in some of those things to get that creative juices flowing and then they want to know more. Mm -hmm. um, and also it tells you more about what the students really know. So questioning is a good way to pull out those, um, we'll call them misunderstandings or things that they may have been misguided on and to really understand what they know and what they don't know um, and what they need guidance on. It can be better for, um, you know, if we ask a yes, no question, kids can guess and 50% of the time they're gonna get it right. Um, but if we really ask some good questions and they have to elaborate on things, then we're really getting to the heart about what they do know or don't know. And less guessing, mm -hmm. <laughs> of course, this, all, this goes back to the assessing of um, their knowledge base. If we can really hone in on what they, what they do know, what they, they understand, then we can start to develop the inquiry questions and gain more knowledge for them in the end. So what, what are the components that make a really good question? Let's talk a little bit about yep, this. We're going to get into our Zoom screen here, and we're going to call on some people. I'm going to go back to our... Get, why don't you discuss this in your groups a little bit about what makes a good question? And, and if you're alone or by yourself, just go ahead and maybe jot down a few ideas on what you think, would a, what a good question it is, and why. Like, why is it a good question? We're gonna model good um, questioning here. So we're gonna give you just a, a minute or two, and then we'll come back and we'll try to share some ideas. Now you can see us double. Okay. So, did you just call on people? How, how I had people? some volunteers last time. All right, so who would like to share what you think a good question is or what your idea of a good question might be? You can just unmute yourself to share. Well, we definitely want to avoid yes or no questions. Am I on? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, okay. and then sometimes you need to ask a yes or no question. You always want to follow that up with a and why or how did you know that or what evidence do you have to prove that? Okay. Evidence is a good one, especially if you're trying to dig deeper. So, and sometimes, you know, what happens is you get yourself, you maybe accidentally ask a yes or no question, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just like Stephanie said, follow through, dig deeper, get those thought processes going. What else and how else could you ask that question to get into what they're really thinking or what they really understand? But yeah, that was a good one. Does anybody know what those, what that, um, the yes, no question is too? They said, just make sure it's not a Googleable question. So if they can Google it, then is it a good question? <laughs> Anybody else want to share? We talked about drawing on personal experiences and getting them to relate to themselves to whatever you're questioning or the, um, whatever you're discussing. Great. Adding a little piece of themselves into the conversation. It really starts their brain um, juices flowing more. 
Yes, and personalizing it. That helps personalize the information too. So once they, you know, if they've learned something from it, they're going to make the connection to the real, their real life as well. So yeah, good one. Anybody else? Well, let's go on and see um, some different ideas for you here. All right, go back to our presentation here. Hopefully we're not making you dizzy by flipping through all this. Okay, so um, we can kind of look at this flow chart as we think about asking questions. So asking question, uh, better questions is really about um, using that questioning um, process to foster inquiry. Okay, we're going to talk about that word inquiry in a minute, but how can we foster inquiry by being curious? We want to be curious about ki what kids have to say and what kids are um, meaning when they say um, their answer. And also we want to foster that inquiry by being open and asking those opinion questions and by being non-judgmental. We need to really think about their feelings here and how if we shut them down right away when there is something that we consider a wrong answer, that might just shut them down from answering in the future. So we really wanna be non-judgmental and open about different answers. And I think this one's important too because if, if they do give a wrong answer or what you feel is a wrong answer, then maybe inquire deeper and say, well, why do you feel that way? Or what, how can you back that up and um, give them the opportunity to defend their thinking? And that then again will help personalize them. And so when, they, when you are able to get around to what is the right answer, it'll have more meaning for them. And some of that relates um, back to being curious because um, we might say, well, I'm curious, why do you say that? I'm curious about your story there. I'm curious about you know, uh, what you mean. If, if you ask for some clarification, they might give it to you and you might understand better. Right, and individualize it. So mm -hmm. being curious about what they're thinking is and their thought process is also inquiring about the person themselves. And so you're establishing a relationship with them just by asking them questions about their thought processes and what they are thinking and their background knowledge, um, which in turn might, um, like I said, personalize the learning for them. So, so what is inquiry? Um, this is a big um, word in education today and our science standards are changing in the state. And we're, we're doing a lot that is very inquiry based and it's actually the ask of ask the act of asking for information. So we think about that, some of our close-ended questions, um, like yes, no questions, or one that there's only one right answer. We wonder sometimes, is, is that really asking for enough information? A yes or no answer might not quite be enough. But if we have a yes or no followed up by a why, or how do you know that, then um, we get at that good information we're looking for. And have you guys ever heard a teacher or yourselves maybe even say, do we all understand? Does everybody understand? Does everybody get it? How many of you have ever used that? Just raise your hand. I have. I've used it. I've used it several times. <laughs> and you know what's funny about that is if you think about that, what is that really assessing? That is one of those that's kind of like it's, it's your last chance to answer, and as long as everybody doesn't say anything, we're gonna move on to the next thing. Yes. And so really, you're taking all of that personalization out of it and just saying, okay, I'm done with this topic, we're gonna to move on. And so taking that sort of uh, question out of the mix is, is a good idea. And who does that really help in the end? Because are you really understanding who does get it and who doesn't get it? Absolutely not. <laughs> and so you might want to ask something like, what questions do you have? And um, don't let anyone off the hook have everybody still ask a question. And one way you can get around that in a timely fashion is to have them whisper their question to a neighbor and see if the neighbor can answer their question for them. That'll increase your engagement. Yeah, and later, um, Stephanie and I are going to talk about a few of those 
um, ways that you can kind of engage all of your learners, who, how many ever you have in the room at one time, how you can kind of foster these types of questions within a whole group of students where everybody has to answer. And I think that's one of the important things is that your students have to realize that nobody's going to get by without some sort of an answer, that they, their feedback is essential and, and it's, it's valued. And so we're going to talk about some of those ideas later. Okay, so there's two um, main categories when we're asking questions. Closed. So on a closed um, question, one example is, is this animal a vertebrate? Okay. That could be answered with a simple, yes it is, no it's not. Right? It, we could have even said, is this animal a vertebrate or invertebrate? And there's still one short answer. It's like a 50-50 chance that you get it right. Another um, higher level question for maybe more of a high school kid would be, is a democracy the best form of government? Well, they can answer with a yes or a no. And with this one, I mean, these are both two ways, like you could start with this type of question, but you need to take it again deeper. And that's what our next ones are kind of um, involved so with. When we look at that second category, it's open questions or open-ended questions sometimes. And uh, one example would be, what characteristics make this animal a vertebrate? Compare vertebrates to invertebrates. And even how do you know those types of questions are open-ended questions because they're having to dig deeper into what they understand or may not understand. And then that high school example would be something like, in your opinion, what's the best form of government and why? Okay, so we're acknowledging that this is an opinion question here, but then they have to back it up with some facts. Um, and I think we're gonna take just a minute here. If you guys wanna, you know, as I mentioned, sometimes as, as educators and in the education field, we kind, of, we kind of fall back on some of these questions and, and it's just natural for us. So how can you guys push beyond that? So if you do ask one of these closed-ended questions, how could you take that then, you know, let them go ahead and answer, and then how could you take that one step further? Kind of think about that for just a minute. And then we'll share out. Okay, let's think about some people we haven't heard from yet. Neely Oakdale, what do you think there? Ask them to expand on the answer. Good, ask them to expand. So, so how would you, Neely Oakdale, when you say ask them to expand on the answer, how would you go about doing that? Can you be more specific? Is this animal a vertebrate? If they say vertebrate, say, how do you know that? Mm hmm Okay. Good. Cassie's group up here. What do you guys think? Okay. You're still muted, Cassie. All oh, right. Can Okay, try again. Oh, now can you hear us? Yep. Okay. That's totally, uh, I'm muted. Oh, okay. Well, Cassie's group, we're sorry. <laughs> Somehow we're getting feedback from you. If you want to post it in the chat, you could do that too. You want to post your comment in the chat field and we can read it from there. While they're doing that, what about out at Christ Lutheran? Muted. On my end? Yeah. 
There you go. Oh. Hmm. We don't have any audio from you either, okay. Christ Lutheran. So you want to put that in the chat box? There's a little chat right at the bottom of your um, Zoom link that you can click on and put that in there. All right, let's try one more. See if we can get one to share here. Sorry, I'm flipping through my pages. How about Mrs. Larson? Okay, can you, I think we're the ones that are giving you feedback. That's okay. Go ahead and try to share with us here. Okay. Go ahead. They sent it in their question. Oh, that's bad. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Well, that's okay. I know you guys all probably have some really great ideas. Um, I, and I think another follow-up question to all, to all of that is too, are there times that you need to ask some of those closed questions versus open questions? And I think about some of you are at reading mastery schools and you probably help with reading groups and it's a scripted lesson that you need to follow. And a lot of those questions are closed questions. So, I mean, that's something to think about that, you know, if you're following a scripted program, you really do need to follow that script. Um, so there are times like this. Um, and we did have a chat um, on the chat, we can read, yep. that um, we'll just go ahead and read this. That ask what other kind of vertebrates there are um, for democracy. Um, you could say, which form of government is best? What kind of government does your family talk about at home? Okay, and um, oftentimes with younger kids, we want to talk about that. What does your family talk about? What do you do at home, you know, and really draw on their life experience and um, really get them to pick their curiosity is like you might ask something like if the United States had to choose another form of government, which would be our best choice and why, you know, those high school kids might really get into that and um, um oh oh we have a suggestion that maybe Stuart has two computers on in the same room if so that could be your feedback issue um okay so let's continue on here thinking right. about um our questioning so we have some qualities of good questioning and this is going to kind of relate to a slide that we talked about earlier and some of the activities that we talked about earlier. But um, one of the qualities of a good question, again, can actively involve students in the lesson. And so we've talked about points like making sure we bring in prior knowledge, connecting it to home, connecting it to um, other curriculum areas, other content and lessons previous, that can help them get actively involved. And so when you ask them a question, if you are asking them a question that um, invokes curiosity and inquiry, those types of questions are going to get the students all involved with answering. And so you, that is, that's your main goal. You want all of them directly involved with the question that you're asking. And also, I think when we think about the group size, you know, if you're working with two students, it's really hard for somebody to check out. But the larger that group gets, the easier it is for someone to not answer. And so um, when you talk about actively being involved in the lesson, um, you know, you want to increase the number of times they answer each student. So have them answer to a partner or somebody like that. And so that everybody's talking and everybody's accountable. And you want the, if, if it's a good question, it's going to increase their motivation, increase their interest in the topic. And so I know sometimes, especially you guys as paras, you may not um, have a deep love of the topic or a deep love of the, the conversation that you're supposed to have with these kids. But if you are motivating too, when you ask the questions and asking questions that can um, pique their interest, 
they're going to be way more involved with you and with the conversation and the content. Okay, we talked again about evaluating students' preparation before. How, how much do they remember from before? Oh, sorry about that. I pushed the wrong button. Um, and again, that we might check on the completion of their work. So the questions that we ask in the morning might be about their homework the night before. Like, did you do your homework and have you learned what you needed to from that homework? And I always like to, when the kids came in in the morning, like if you have them starting off in the morning or right after a lesson, um, or you had them the day before, why not check back in with the topic or the objective that you had the day before and say, hey, did you learn anything new about an invertebrate? Did you see one on your walk home? Um, relate back to that information so that kid is making a connection back to that same information. <laughs> Um, and this one obviously keeps coming up because if it is a good question, it's going to invoke critical thinking and it's going to get the students processing the information in a different way rather than just answering a question. Um, we rather just than don't want one wrote. quick response, but instead that it activates some really deep thinking. Okay, so now we're going to talk about some different types of questions. And the first one is um, knowledge questions. This is basically, this is kind of, these types of questions are kind of, um, at, we're starting at a lower level. And so basically knowledge questions just recall data or recall information. So, um, you know, I think of this as vocabulary. So if you ask, what is the definition of um, an invertebrate? then they can give that to you. That is a knowledge base. That's a recalling of the data that they, or information that they learned. The next one is comprehension. In comprehension, they really start to understand more of the meaning and we get, it's, it's a little higher level thinking. And then application is using, it's taking that concept and using it in a new situation. So if you're talking about like questioning an application question, they're going to take a concept that they learned and they're going to apply it somewhere else. And those start to really invoke that innovative, creative thinking process with questioning. And next we have synth uh, analysis, sorry, analysis. Um, this is, um, we separate the concepts into parts or just, uh, distinguish between facts and inferences and again we're crawling up that ladder of high level of thinking and then after that is synthesis and you guys don't have to remember all these terms but just kind of um, recognize the levels and synthesis is going to take those parts and and form a new meaning so they're going to take the parts that they are understanding they're going to put them together and then they're going to develop a meaning for themselves um, something that is definitely more personalized and the highest level would be evaluation where they start to make judgments um, about the value of ideas or products really what do you think and why do you think it and what evidence leads you to that so um, as we climb up this ladder the kids are really getting to that high level of thought so just know we don't always want them answering just those knowledge based questions of what's the right answer choose a b c or d for your answer we really want them thinking of their own ideas as they go up so Okay, so this is great information, but how? How do we do this? How can we ask questions that foster this inquiry? How do we get ourselves to think in that manner as well when we're working with students? So we have um, a couple different slides. We're going to talk about some questioning details. Um, so first of all, Go ahead, Stephanie. Um, so wait time is really important when we're asking questions. Um, and the ideal wait time is three to five questions, or uh, seconds after asking that question. Before you ask for any response, we actually pause for three to five seconds. And it seems like nothing, three to five seconds. <laughs> But actually, you kind of have to count in your head um, and and uh, give yourself a little bit of time there. And definitely what you're wanting kids to do then is I used to tell my kids, okay, you know, I'd ask a question and say, now I want everybody to lock an answer in their head. Okay. And so that they're really thinking about it and everybody's coming up with an answer, not just sitting back. 
And I think, as many of you know, I, I was horrible at this as a teacher. And so I'd actually have to physically set a timer for myself to make sure that I allowed that time for my students to think. And it's kind of funny because when I would watch my students, if I gave them that time, not only was I squirming because it felt like a really long time, but they were squirming in their seats because they knew that they had to have an answer, that they had to come up with something, and that they weren't just going to get by with no answer because we did some of the activities that we're going to talk about later where we um, pair shared, but they had this, this three to five second wait time. And I set my standard high. I did five seconds to start with so that I could practice it. Um, but I literally really did set a timer for myself. And so when the timer went off, it was a cue for me, but it was also a cue for the students. And what I found happened is when the timer went off and I said, okay, they had to think, pair, share some of the um, processes, they would do it as soon as the timer went off. So it set the timer for myself, but it also set a timer for them as to they knew when they had to respond and how they had to respond. So it actually worked out pretty awesome. We really need to think about the kids who just need that little bit of extra time. We all have blurters in our groups, right? Mm -hmm. And those kids are ready to blurt the answer, you know, almost before you're done asking the question. But some of our kids do need a little bit more time, and it's not fair to them to call on the blurters all the time or allow the blurting. Right. And it gives them time to process the information as well. So another example is the um, individual response where one person answers, but you have to give them all the opportunity first. And this kind of relates back to the wait time. So you may call on an individual person to answer, but they all know, your class needs to know, or your kids that you're working with needs to know that they all have to process the information because they may be the one um, that has to answer. And I used, when I did use the individual response within my class or my, with my students is I used a random name generator and so that it could be any of them. So that helped them understand that they would or could potentially be asked to answer the question. So when they so, had that wait time, they had to process. So a random name generator is an app usually. And um, we have some of those in our resources and the app, basically you can put in all the kids' names in your class or in your group maybe, maybe for your reading group or something like that. And um, you know, you pick, you push the button and it randomly pops up a name. And actually then, you know, just a side effect of it all is it adds in some wait time for you. Yes. Um, so that's kind of nice there. <laughs> But I always like, whenever I have an individual response, I like to follow it up with my next um, example here, and that's a choral response. Um, because individual response, I find out what one kid knows, and with a choral response, I want my, my class to all answer together. And so I want to hear the answer again from everyone. Now with open-ended questions, sometimes that's hard, and we can't get a great choral response because it's a different answer for each kid. And in that case, I would definitely ask several kids an individual response. Uh, but a choral response, again, there might be a cue or a tap, or you might just say everybody. Um, Anita Archer, who's a big guru in education, puts her hand out like this, and that's the cue for the whole class to respond. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the choral response is where, you know, if you, if you want to assess a, a particular group of students, I would just go walk over by that group of students if I thought that they maybe weren't understanding and I'd go stand by them to see what kind of response they give, but everybody was giving the response. So that is a good and I remember in my first year teaching, uh, before I really even knew, I, I, I don't think I knew all about choral responses at that time, but I just was feeling like I had a group of 26 second graders, and they were so massive that I thought, that little kid in the back row, I'm not so sure that they're hearing a thing that is going on. So I would definitely ask for those choral responses a lot. Okay, and the next one is, Always ask the question first. Um, you don't want to call on a student and then ask the question because at that point, when you call on a student, guess what happens to all the rest of them? They shut down. I don't have to answer this. This isn't for me. For instance, if I say, Tina, um, what is a good question? Only Tina is going to think of the answer. Uh, if I say class, I want you all to think of what makes a good question. And I'm going to give you some time to really lock that answer in your head.
Okay, Tabitha, <laughs> what makes a good question? So okay. see, was that a practice in wait time or what? Because I was getting a little, I got an answer. <laughs> <laughs> but it really does give the kids who need that just extra couple seconds that time. Okay, and the next one is to focus on the objective. What are you really wanting them to get out of that, those questions that you're asking? Are you wanting them just to give a yes or no answer? What are you really digging for to get the, what kind of information? Um, and, what do you really want them to know? And, you know, sometimes we focus too much on picky little details. And so it's much better if um, we, we look at that big picture of what do they need to learn. Now, sometimes that's hard for you as parents, right? You're walking in, maybe in the middle of a lesson, you have to just hop in and get going with your students. and. Um, and so that's one where you might need to talk with the teacher before, um, you know, and all that plan time that you two have together, right? Mm -hmm. um, but um, really think about that bigger objective of why are they learning what they're learning. And don't lead. Don't put words into their mouths. Let them answer with their own thoughts, even if they're headed down the wrong direction. And we talked a little bit about this at our opening meeting. If it's a wrong answer, that's okay, because sometimes they can learn more from a wrong answer. Don't try to lead them into the correct answer. Let them go ahead and share. And so um, also, you know, at our beginning, our August trainings, we talked about um, helping, not telling. And when we're leading them too much, it really is telling them the answer, maybe. <laughs> and I go back to, I think it was like an Adam Sandler movie where he was like, to, to, to today. So that's why I go yeah. back to that <laughs> visual. I think that's kind of funny. Okay. Um, and, and you want to be open but concise. I mean, yes, we want open-ended questions, but some kids we know will go on and on and on and on and on, right? And so, yes, these are open, but we really do need to be kind of succinct and concise about the way that we answer those questions and think about if that was um, a short answer question on a, on a paper or on a test or something, could they get that there or are they kind of mumbling and fumbling through their answer too? And one thing that Stephanie brought up earlier when we were planning and, and going through our details was just because it's an open question and you get an answer to an open question doesn't mean it's the right answer. Um, and I think sometimes that, you know, when we ask those types of open questions just to get an answer is great, but we have to focus on the objective of focus on what it is we want them to know. And if it's wrong, like I said before, it's okay, but we still need to kind of um, um, discover how we can get the right information and steer them in the right direction. Right. So it's okay to say, well, I'm not sure that that really addresses our question, or I'm not really sure. Let's call on someone else, and then I'll come back to you to see if you can revise or um, rethink that. Right. And how, and you can do it along with them, you know, how could we find the right answer? How could we, what do we need to do to find the right answer? Those sorts of things are okay. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. And then also, we always want to use very specific language. Um, actually, um, it's proven that uh, a huge um, uh, impact on kids. It's actually uh, it's actually an effect size, which is some mathematical terms of of 0.75 for using very concise, specific language with kids. So they understand more of what we want when our words are very specific. Now, this next. The next bit of information that we're going to talk about, we're, we're almost out of time here, so I want to make sure that you know, if you go in, there's a document that's called Expeditionary Learning. We're not going to go through all of these, but there are some great examples on here. But if you go to our website, Paris of ESU 8, you will find this resource page. So if you want and some more information on this, make sure you go to that web page to find it. And we asked your principals to make copies, so you probably have this with you today. Yes. Okay, so one thing to do is to do a cold call, okay? So you can call on kids, um, you know, um, call on their name after you answer, ask the question. This is really standard. This is what we're used to in education. I think we grew up with this. Mm -hmm. um, the next one that is used often is the think or ink pair share. It's called think or ink because you could have the kids think of it or they could write about it for a little bit. You give them that wait time and they can write or think freely 
and then they share with a partner or um, you can say turn to your shoulder partner turn to your um, we used clocks turn to your 12 o'clock partner turn to your six o'clock partner depending on how many you have in your group but they have time to think or they have time to write and, and then, then they, they pair share. up because it helps them to answer that question you get a lot of engagement there but also for those kids who are unsure of themselves it gives them a little bit of sense of security to, before they have to share it out to the big group. This one relates to think pair share because it's it's the it's the same kind of concept where you have them okay turn and talk to your partner about um, I'll go back to what is an invertebrate turn and talk turn and talk and so then they have to come up with um, they both have to share each partner has to share and then they actually have to share with the whole group it's a it's a partner share um, and like we said before it's where everybody has to answer nobody is um, allowed to sit on the side and listen okay and then the ones in gray you can go and reference on the um, resource sheet and we'll continue on. One is to use whiteboards. So um, it's considered a very elementary um, thing to um, give kids a question or a math problem or something and they answer it on their whiteboards and then they show you the answer. I always waited to have kids show me at the very end when I was sure everybody had answered. Um, but this is something that even high school kids really can get involved with. So I would um, not hesitate to use that with older kids. So again, um, you ask a question, they answer it on whiteboards, and then on a cue, they, they show it to you. And I use that, I mean, I use that a lot. I use that a lot in elementary. It's just a quick assessment for you, and it makes you give wait time because they have to write it out, and it also allows that process time for students. Um, so the next one is fist to five or thumb -a meter, and this is to me this is a quick assessment also where the students can give you um, anywhere from zero to five on their understanding or on their um, level that they, they are comprehending the information. Um, you could use this in multiple different ways. <clears throat> and I you might say, uh, fist to five, give me fist to five on how many minutes you need to still talk to your partner. And they might do a two or a one or something. Um, or um, you might say fist to five on how well you understand this topic in long division that we're working on today. Um, That's and, how I used it a lot of times, yeah. And then the thumb thermometer um, would be uh, thumbs up, thumbs to the side, thumbs down. Yeah, and again, you know, sometimes those are tough because they're going to see their friends and they don't want to have a thumbs down if their friend has a thumbs up. But it, it, it can be a quick assessment just overall. And you usually know the kids that are going to um, relate to their friends to, to see the answer. But um, we did it where they could also hold it by their seat so they weren't holding it in the air but I could still see their thumbs up or thumbs down um, but yeah so these other ideas in the gray um, are especially good for a larger group and we thought that that might not apply to you Paris quite as much but definitely relate to um, you know or go back to the um, resource page and take a look you know they have the um, uh, parachute right Yes. So, so um, all of you should have um, a little parachute graphic organizer maybe that you were given today in your materials. How about let's see some thumbs up, thumbs down if you got those. Ooh. Okay. Well, one thing is um, just to empower you all is that before each training, we will email out um, our resources to your principals. Um, and, uh, so, um, if you haven't received those from your principal by the Tuesday of our meeting, you might want to ask, and we will also have them available on, on our website if you need to make your own copies then. Okay. Um, so next screen up here is, um, just some random name generators. We talked about that a little bit. If you want to call on kids randomly, um, you know, another thing to, when we start to ask, uh, questions um 
sometimes we call on the same kid over and over and over again. It's the old popsicle trick, a digital way to do the popsicles. Um, popsicle the sticks, generators. Drawn, yeah. drawn sticks or cards in your classroom. And on this slide, I went ahead and just put all the resources that we used as well so that you have another access link to the, not only the random generator tools, but all the topics and details that we've talked about. There's one on there that's called the polar bear one. I can't remember. Um, but that has some really, uh, some questioning videos on there that, that were recorded. So lots of information and resources on there for you that we didn't have time to even um, delve into. But if you want some more on that, there is some more information for you on those slides. And so um, we won't say, do you have any questions? Or uh, we won't say what, um, yeah, do you have any questions? We'll say what questions do you have? <laughs> and, um, and, and let you know that we do welcome those. But before we sign off, um, does anybody have any other questions or concerns with asking questions? We do have all of your names because you registered. Hi, this is Stuart. I was just making sure you're not getting background now. No, we are not now. Okay, so that must have been the problem. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so part of this and getting used to our meetings for this year is just getting like connected, right? And, and getting used to um, how we'll log on together. Um, did, does anybody have, or what questions do you have? See, I'm training myself too. <laughs> what questions do you have about the, this program in general or where to find things? Do you, were you all able to access the website? Now that is a, a closed ended question, but it's one that I need to evaluate. So if you were able to access it, um, could you put a thumbs up for us, please? Yay. All right. Good. Good. Um, and hopefully we developed that to make it as easy as possible. So if you're having trouble finding anything, make sure that you email us and let us know. Yes, um, Butte is asking, do we need to register every time? Yes, please. Um, what that does is it helps us know how many people attend so we can keep a record for our own program here that we're putting on. And you can go on, if you're sure that you're going to register or you're going to watch every time live, go ahead and, and yeah. register all at once. <clears throat> it doesn't have to be separately every month. Do we want to ask if I attend? Um, I don't think we have time. Oh, yeah. We have one minute. Oh. Um, okay, so I'll roll through our credits here so that we're making sure that we give credit for our great um, presentation tool and <laughs> things like that that we use. And I just want to give you all credit. So thank you so much for being here and making time. I know it's not easy to sneak away from classrooms, um, but, um, you know, you made it work. So um, thanks what you do for what you do every day for kids, most of all. And um, thanks for joining us. And please, uh, again, our, our inboxes are open to you anytime. If you have a question about something or um, a concern or a topic that you'd like to have hit. Uh, but uh, we will definitely plan on seeing you October 3rd. Um, and we're going to talk more about confidentiality and FERPA. We had a lot of questions about that at our um, trainings um, at the beginning of the year. And so um, the head of our school psychology department, uh, Kathy Fiala, will join us that day because she works a lot with FERPA. And um, she'll kind of be our expert speaker. And in planning for that, please make sure that you do write down some questions that you may have for her. And so that Hopefully we'll have some question and answer time at the end that you can ask her some of your um, pertinent questions that you have. So again, make sure you write those down before we have our meeting so that when we come to our meeting, you can answer, we'll have enough time to answer all your questions, hopefully. Yep. So thank you all. Thank you all. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. I don't see the record.